Hey guys, Alex Williamson here, and I want to talk to you today about Kabamba, uh, Kabamba Carolini, Caroliniana, and uh, that's purple Kabamba, red Kabamba, scarlet Kabamba, it has different names, but the reason I'm coming to you with this video early in the morning is because you can see that it is closed up, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Usually it's all furled out like this, but this one is still closed up since I just turned the light on. It'll be changing soon. Um... This plant has a really interesting history. It crosses over with Epistogramma azizii, and the man that is that is named after it crosses over with Darwin, and the discoverer of it is a very famous botanist who discovered a lot of other plants. So stay tuned for some history. I'll go over the care notes first really quick so that if you're just interested in how to care for it, um, you can get that out of the way. If you want to hear the history, that'll be the second part of the video. So... To care for it, you want to put it in water of 6.8 to 7.5 pH, ideally. It'll go a little bit lower pH than that, but it doesn't do well in high pH. It's a, a North and South American plant that is usually in flowing water streams or flowing lakes. Um, it grows up to 10 feet tall, and it comes out of the water and flowers. So um, it needs medium light at least. Um, maybe your most powerful LED hood would be okay if you had fertilizer in the water, but really you want to get something better. I've got a Fluval 2.0, um, a Fluval Aquasky at my other tank works just fine. Um, it starts reaching though, even in the shade of a good tank. Um, you can see that the segments start growing farther apart down, down in here. Um, compared to the top and uh, you want to keep those nice and tight if you can so then you can clip it and replant it and it looks nice and lush um, when you buy it at the store it is usually um, going to be a bushy clump of a bunch of them rubber banded together that looks really full but when they do that uh, be careful when you take the rubber band off because it'll rip some of the roots or um, plant and also if you decide to cut it if it's really long um, don't rip it or tear it just take scissors and cut it right above or below one of the um, branches essentially uh, one of the segments in it now this plant is really interesting uh, in its reproduction in that if you leave it in nature in the summer it comes up in the spring and summer up to the water top and it then breaches the water it has this uh, nice soft yellow petal that um, pops up and it, it reaches two or three centimeters tall and then it unfurls into two the first few days it is a female uh, part of the plant and then the second the end of the second day or the beginning of the third day, it suddenly genetically turns to the male half of the plant. And it can be um, pollinated by um, flies or by water taking it away or, um, you know, bees and other uh, insects. But it doesn't need the insects necessarily. Any sort of movement in the water can actually cause it to pollinate and also it can cause the singular plant to pollinate itself if it's undergoing that transition window so kind of cool little fact about that pardon the algae on the front of the glass but now we're going to get into some uh, more interesting stuff about the history of the plant so what I was talking about, the the flower having two sexual parts, that wasn't known later, and that's called um, protogenus. Um, that's a protogenus plant. Uh, this is described by Darwin later. Uh, this plant is actually... Um, an early discovery in America in the Enlightenment period. It was found in uh, Florida and in Texas, Louisiana, and then it's also found all throughout South um, and Central America. Asa Gray is the name of the man who discovered it. He lived from 1810 until 1888, and he was a very... Um, very, very well-studied, well-traveled uh, botanist. He identified over a thousand different species from 1849 to 1853 on a trip that he took through Texas, then through the Rocky Mountains, then down through uh, New Mexico and into Mexico. 
Um, he actually needed an armed uh, guard on the on the um, trip because of Native Americans and because of Texas settlers and um, Spanish settlers that were still there and the contention that was still in the territory at the time. Now, originally, he was a religious man, and he fought against Darwin's ideas. He didn't think that um, God would allow something to start out simple and get more complex. He thought that um, everything we have started more complex and then got more simple. Um, at the time, there were a lot of different opinions floating around and a lot of people talking publicly and getting quite passionate about all these things. Uh, this sparked Darwin's um, attention and they started corresponding. In 1855, they finally met, but um, over the course of the next 25 years, they actually wrote over 300 known letters back and forth discussing their theories with one another. And um, they both contributed a great deal of illustrations of um, botanical specimen. Um, also, Gray did uh, both terrestrial and aquatic species, um, but he was not afraid to get into the water, into the jungle, and really um, find different and unique uh, plants. So another interesting little tidbit was that he got into a argument with Louis Agassiz, who was a Swiss-born um, botanist, naturalist. Back then, uh, Darwinism wasn't necessarily called Darwinism yet. It was called, you know, evolution. It was called um, selective uh, complication, you know, um, compounding... Uh, organism theory there were a bunch of different names floating around a bunch of ridiculous names floating around for it darwin wasn't the first one to come up with it um also gray was talking about it um and finally it was darwin's letters from the galapagos island and his study of finch and of turtles that caused him to realize that uh it was, in fact, possible that God created something simple and then it got more complex. So whereas Darwin didn't necessarily need God in the equation, um, Asa Gray, the discoverer of Kabamba, uh, decided that he would use uh, examples like Kabamba and its adaptation to pollinate and its uh, growth rate and different color changes to show how complex an organism can be and how um, magnificent God's creations could be. So he was stayed a religious man, but he wrote a book um, called Darwiniana, and uh, he also illustrated a lot of botanical drawings along with that book in a collection of papers. So kind of interesting. Uh, he got into an argument with Louis... Agassiz, as I mentioned, and if you are an aquarium lover, you probably recognize that name slash word from the Epistogramma Agassizii, um, fire red, or um, uh, different subspecies of the Epistogramma, um, and those are named after him, but he was a Swiss at first, anti-Darwinist, anti-evolutionist, uh, he thought that animals were the way they were, and they were complex, and that showed that God was great, and that was kind of the end of the story to him. And so between Darwin and Asa Gray and the Kabamba and all these other plants and species in the mix, um, it was all argued back and forth until finally in the 1870s. 1871 or so, a couple years before his death, um, Louis 
Agassiz finally um, believed in Darwinism, but he actually was one of the founders of social Darwinism, who put a racist twist on it and said that some plants and species and races of humans were superior to others and were designed to take over and uh, show the way. And so even though this Swiss man is talking to this uh, American botanist and a British botanist um, and naturalist, that led the way in the 1870s and 80s for social Darwinism and the whole idea of manifest destiny or that we needed to tame these um, simple moving to complex uh, Native Americans by the standards of the time. So the expansion of America is actually even tied to your fish tank. So uh, just thought this was kind of an interesting plant the fact that it opens and closes, the fact that it's tied to so many historic figures and that it actually factors into a war between evolution or intelligent design and uh, creationist uh, beliefs. And then the fact that the people arguing about that, um, we actually have other fish named after um, the South American uh, epistogramma Agassiziae. So um, just kind of some cool tidbits about the plant. I hope uh, you have it in your tank and you enjoy it. Uh, I'd recommend it in a larger tank, even though it can be in a small tank. It requires more care and more intense light. So if you have any questions, um, let me know. Uh, last little tidbit about the plant. Keep it away from Oscars or big cichlids. They'll tear it apart. It's a gentle plant. Be kind. Be kind to the plant people. Um, other than that, though, uh, I'm going to leave you here, and uh, I hope you look forward to the next video. Let me know if you dig all this uh, history background or if it's getting way too off track. But I like to look at the world from a fishbowl looking out, and I hope you enjoy it too. If you learn something, please like, please subscribe, and uh, I'll talk to you next time. Keep on swimming, guys. Bye.